Here we are, Scott. So I leave the word to you. You know, guys, you have exactly 55 minutes to end this amazing panel. Your words, man. Go, go ahead. All right, Enzo. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, what I'd like to do really is just introduce the panel. We've got a super exciting panel today. Uh, and so the first person I'd like to introduce is Olga Sommer. Olga is Director of Revenue at the Nobu in Portman Square in London. So very excited about your perspective, Olga. But tell us a little bit about yourself and, and, uh, and what you do there and, and uh, why you're joining us today. Ah, well, I was, um, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. It's great to be um, on a panel. Super excited to be in your company. Uh, Scott, you're absolutely legendary, and everyone who created this uh, series of uh, Revenue Bazaar, I think it's a fantastic job, so well done. Um, so my name is Olga, I'm Director of Revenue at newly opened um, Noble Portman Square Hotel in London. It was quite an interesting experience um, opening hotel during the pandemic. Um, it definitely, um, it's been really off an eye-opener. And um, I've been in this trip for 20 years, out of which 10 is in Revenue, with spent in Revenue Management. So um, this topic today is very close to my heart because I, I think revenue management is nothing but thinking about profitability. So it's a big part of it in what we do. Absolutely. Thanks. So definitely looking forward to getting your uh, getting your perspective. I'm just going to go around clockwise if it's OK. It's kind of a weird reunion for me today. Uh, yes. Both versions of my professional past are represented. Uh, but first, let me introduce uh, Baggy Chen. Uh, Maggie and I actually had the, the, the pleasure of teaching together at EHL for several years. Maggie's still at EHL, absolutely one of the experts in distribution uh, and uh, an absolutely fantastic teacher as well. So Maggie, tell us, I've told everybody everything about you already, but tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, thank you so much, Scott. It is really nice to reunion with Scott this way. And uh, I'm an assistant professor at Echo Hotelier de Lausanne. And uh, as as Scott said, I basically for me, distribution is one of my research topic. I am passionate to know how to help uh, hoteliers and uh, uh, I participate in different kind of uh, conferences, but it is an honor to be here to share uh, my observation with all these practitioners. And uh, uh, I also hope I can hear from the industry uh, about what we want to do with uh, customer acquisition cost. Thanks, Maggie. And now I'm going to roll the time machine back ever so slightly further and welcome Raul Moranta. Raul and I had the benefit or the pleasure of working together uh, some time ago uh, at Hershaw Hospitality in in, uh, in the United States. And now Raul is Chief Commercial Officer of uh, Remington Hospitality, one of the largest third-party managers in the United States. Uh, really, really interesting perspective, Raul. I'm really excited you're here. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Nope. You're, I think you might be muted. There you go, of course. Go. It is COVID time, so we are all muted. <laughs> uh, but very happy to be here. Um, obviously, we've worked together, so we, we've known each other for some time. Uh, I think I, I might be the only person in the panel that is not in, uh, or at least is in the US. But um, but I'll, hopefully, I'll bring the US perspective uh, into the panel. Um, I've joined uh, Remington as a chief commercial officer uh, in December. So it's been an interesting experience to um, try to figure out how we ramp up and uh, grow revenues in a, um, obviously a, a depressed revenue environment. So, but very excited to be uh, here. We have, um, uh, I am based out of Dallas, uh, Texas. We have uh, about 80 hotels um, in uh, continental US. So we have uh, hotels in the, the United States. Um, and then we have one hotel in Alaska. So. Uh, mostly branded, uh, we do have about uh, 12 independent hotels, which, as you know, um, distribution and cost of distribution for independent hotels is, is very different on the branded environment. But very happy to be here. Um, thank you for the invite. Thanks, Ro. We're definitely looking forward to having your, uh, your sort of large portfolio um, uh, perspective. I think it'll be very interesting as we, as we move forward. So let me just kind of throw it out there. This is all about distribution cost. Uh, I think that even before COVID, uh, we kind of had come to the conclusion that there wasn't a whole lot of profitability left in terms of cutting costs. Uh, we don't control taxes. We don't control insurance. We don't control all these things. And yet there's all this money being spent on distribution. And, and I think uh, of, of another friend of ours, another friend of the show, uh, Max Starkov, uh, kind of described it at one point as the last 
a frontier. So what I'd like to do, uh, for those that know the format, we kind of base our discussion on some of the posts from the Hospitality Net Revenue Optimization Panel. So I'm going to go right to Max's post, and I'm just going to read the first line, and then I'm going to ask a couple of people to comment about it. And that was that he said, we need to start treating direct online distribution costs as distribution costs. So I know we all have some passion about that, but let me, uh, Maggie, let me ask you first. First of all, what does he mean for people that don't, uh, uh, that don't have quite as much of an understanding of it? Well, for me, I feel like, you know, we need to differentiate distribution cost and customer acquisition cost. Distribution cost are related to uh, OTA commissions, okay, the discounts you offer to tour operators. But on the other hand, there are many other costs uh, which are not considered by me as distribution cost. So for example, uh, earlier, uh, Raul mentioned about he has a branded hotel and independent hotel. For branded hotel, you have uh, brand charges, right? And, uh, and whether you are branded or independent, you have sales and marketing related expenses. You have CRS fees, you have GDS fees. And all these are uh, considered by me as the customer acquisition cost. But uh, we should say it this way, cost of, uh, customer acquisition cost is bigger than the distribution cost. And when we really want to think about profitability, we cannot just think about the distribution cost, the commissions. We need to have the holistic view of all other expenses related. That's how I see it. Perfect. So, okay. Olga, let me. I'm just going to ask you, kind of, as a follow up. You were another person that, that, when we talked about all these, this was one of the, the posts that you zeroed in on as well. What's your take on it? You know, what, why, how do we need to start looking at this cost thing? Yeah, I actually look at exactly the same as Maggie. At the end of the day, you you need to put all your costs together. What owners want to know: how much revenue did we make in a period of time? How much did it cost us? And what is left at the end of it? Right. So, and in some like franchise or charges might be quite chunky, you know. So when we're talking about cost, for me, that's all marketing activities, whether they are using external companies or internal, all the kind of what, what everything you have on PL, everything that goes into marketing. So for me, it is, I also see it as customer acquisition costs so all together because, and very often you can't necessarily always differentiate it. So I think it's, it's easier to track it this way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really great point. So, and Raul, I want to ask you the same question. First of all, very general in that sense, but also if you wouldn't mind, I think Olga just mentioned a really interesting point, which is tracking. And so you have the biggest portfolio, therefore you're the one playing find the numbers the most probably. So talk a little bit about how do we find it all? Because it's obviously not all sitting in the same place too. So. Yeah, and I think we, um, th the issue of tracking has a lot more to do with technology that has to do with distribution. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, you can have, uh, let's say, a Priceline reservation that is connected through the brands, uh, through GDS. You can have it through uh, a direct connectivity, through um, a, a CRS, or you can have it booking through, uh, you know, a, a direct connectivity. Those are going to have very different costs and have nothing to do with the fact that you want to have an OTA, uh, uh, an opaque reservation. It's just that uh, the, the distribution channels are very fragmented in terms of technology and every company has a very different technology platform, which then forces us to have different cost uh, measures. Um, and I think because of that, it is very difficult for us to be able to track all of the expenses at the same time because they all not, not all go through the PL. In the case of margins, those margins go through, uh, they actually happen pre-transaction. So they take their margin out, we get our net revenue, so we never see that. For our side, we have used uh, probably one of the companies that have done uh, the, the, the best job, at least in the US, is Calibri Labs. They have been able to do some calculations and cost calculations outside of your PL and have some assumed costs that make it a little bit easier for us to calculate that. Um, the other thing you find is that there isn't an industry-wide um, standardization. We have done a far better job of standardizing market segments that we have done a channel distribution. Because as I said, you can have that an OTA reservation could come via GDS, could come directly to the property on a fax. Uh, so because of that, we, we don't have a generic way to do that. Um, I would also tell you that 
you is very hard for you to find uh, channel distribution on a PNL, or if you are doing a pro forma or you are doing some sort of due diligence, it's very difficult to find that information for any system. And I think until that happens, until we find it on a PNL or we find a standardized way to do that, it's going to be very difficult to calculate it the right way for all the hotels. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. point. That's a very good point. So let, let's dig a little bit into that, if you don't mind, a little bit further. And Maggie, I want to come back to you. So yeah. uh, you mentioned all those costs of acquisition. Some of them, uh, they might not be in the same place, but at least we can find them. Um, you know, you can kind of understand what your margin was on every transaction. Boy, based yep. on the way we move our rates, that's a super hard moving ball, but you can kind of figure it out. But some of them are softer than that even, like loyalty costs, right? Exactly. How do you how much of that was acquiring the customers? How much of that was because the brand made us give it to them and it, they would have stayed here anyway? Uh, that, that kind of, how, how about the softer stuff? How do you, I mean, how do we deal with those things? Well, this is the part I, I want to come back to what Raul said. Uh, in you, uh, you know, we all know the uniform system of account. They define revenue, they define different expenses, but they don't define customer acquisition cost. So as you mentioned, there are some soft costs like a loyalty fee, like brand charges. There's no definition, right? So in this case, uh, Raul already told us several times, where do you get the information? And uh, who has the information? So the uh, web related expenses normally are charged to the IT department. And uh, the sales marketing expenses from the brand are for the marketing department. The OTA commissions are in the room department. So you don't have the information in one place. Then there's a delay. The delay of, uh, you know, like Raul told us, you know, there are different ways to get a reservation. When do you receive the bill? When do you book that on the accounting system? So I think this topic is really something uh, we need to have more discussion on, just like what you mentioned, the soft, uh, how do you define the cost of customer acquisition? And since there's no standard, and since the industry uh, has such a uh, huge diversity, it's very difficult to come up with uh, the conclusion to say that, okay, you are going to calculate by taking A, B, C, D, add them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And how about how about you guys all the same thing? I mean, are you able to track it? You have a PL, you have one hotel, yeah. so you might be able to turn under every <laughs> single stone and look for everything. Yeah. Uh, like Raul, who's got to do it with a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, are, are you able to, how much? I mean, there's a diminishing return in, in, to a certain extent in some of it, right? So, how do you balance yeah. that? Yeah, so I worked actually in the hotel group where I was looking 23 hotels and, and I can relate to what Raul was saying. It's it's very different when you have standalone property because yes, I can I can look, look at what was revenue made and look at the PL and I do actually look at all of those costs associated and commission it. And that's that's then I can see what is left at the end of the day, kind of, you know, for this set period of time, usually months. Um but for the bigger chains, it is a little bit, it is more tricky because they are tracked differently. That's why I prefer to have them all kind of bundled together. Yes, it may not be precise to one booking exactly, but it gives, mm -hmm. you know, percentages. It still gives an idea where we are. And I don't think it's, it's more about seeing the trends rather than having precise exactly, you know, two T results because the trends are really important to, to track. Um, and even right now, are we in a position to drop some of the less profitable channels? I don't think so. Um, but tracking it, keeping keeping kind of in mind where you want to get with it. And and I use pace. Um, pace, I think, is a good kind of indicator. Are you when you're running campaigns and revenue and marketing should be working really closely and GMs together because um, to see the results, you don't see results from each individual campaigns exactly, but over a period of time, you can actually see mm -hmm. those trends and pace improving. And that's really the most important. So are we moving into the right direction or not? Or do we need to slightly change our course? Um, so for me, it is kind of slightly bigger picture. And even if we utilizing channels that are possibly less profitable um, over time, okay, we, we just, we will get to the way we need to get, you know, that that's my kind of Yes, I'm able to see overall the, the spent on marketing expenses and cost of transition. 
Thanks, Olga. Raul, you mentioned Calibri Labs. I think that's probably a really good, uh, you know, little free endorsement for Calibri Labs. Obviously, Cindy has to screen, really one of the thought leaders in, in, uh, in the whole distribution thing. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the original white paper that drove rate parity, whether you like rate parity or not, it was fun at least. Uh, but Cindy <laughs> Estes Green was really, really heavily uh, involved in that uh, process too. And that's, and she's the founder of Calibri. So, I mean, kind of in the context of that information role, how do you, how, I mean, how, how effective do you feel like you are in, in, in using all of that to be able to manage your portfolio? Um, so th the best way to describe it is we, we have Calibri Labs where we feel individual hotels have uh, we have the ability to grow revenues or maximize profitability in each individual hotel. In general, because we have a high uh, number of hotels that are within the Marriott environment or within the Hilton environment, then we do um, distribution and profitability by those channels because, again, you have all the, the, the normalized distribution channels are the set, set up the same way. Or, for example, on the independent side, one of the things that we uh, we have historically done is that every single one of our independent hotels, it is under one single platform for CRS, uh, uh, PMS, and RMS, which means that what we have done is we have a um, uh, an analytics application, we have, ha have Power BI, and what we have been able to do is do a what we call a translator, which is we have to take a look at what does the Marriott environment say um, it is... Um, uh, direct channel versus what Hilton says versus one independent hotel. And we have to find translators in order to normalize all the information. So as a portfolio, we are able to make um, assumptions based on what I call the highest common denominator, which is we probably do it at the master channel. Um, and then again, there's going to be some caveats between, you know, one information and the other. Um, but again, you, you know, we optimize at the individual level we have high level discussions at the higher level because again getting granular level for for full portfolio when you're dealing with probably four or five different family of brands is very difficult for us to do yeah i think so and actually i want to ask you this kind of a, a follow-up question about that um you mentioned the brands uh and effectively you're trying to control costs that you're not the person negotiating the contract that's impacting the cost so, do, I mean, do you feel like that you have less ability to control, to control that in a brand environment? Do you feel like the brand's buying power and its ability to negotiate a better deal makes up for that? I mean, how, how does that work, brand versus independent? Yeah, you definitely have, um, if you have a brand, you will have better margins. There's no doubt about it. Uh, as an independent uh, operator, you are going to have, um, obviously, a, a higher uh, cost margins. You do have more flexibility in terms of the programs you can participate or not, but 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 you do. Yeah, I mean, independent hotel is always going to run a higher margin. I think that where we have the ability to control cost in terms of brands, it is whether we choose to participate or not to participate in different promotions. Reality is, if you take a look at where what happens with the brands in the middle of COVID, is brands have different promotions. In most cases, they allow those promotions to go into an OTA. So they said, you know, we are going to do a, um, you know, uh, uh, save and 15, 20% off. The, the, the OTAs did a far better job at the distribution and marketing piece of that. Um, so sometimes, for example, if we wanted to participate in a brand promotion, we got a disproportionate amount of increase through an OTA for that promotion, as opposed to the brand channel itself. So um, in a lot of situations, what ended up happening is that um, we loved it for weekdays, but we are sometimes at capacity on weekends. And then it was a situation where we're not managing the channel, we're managing the day a week for that specific promotion in order to have more or less of that particular channel. Hmm. Okay. And so oh, let me let's just kind of ask you ask you the same thing really it's kind of the question of of the that you know you have some independence right you you have some benefit of some some scale but also probably a little bit more independence you probably ride right in that place that we we'd all like to be kind of halfway in between um how much control do you have you would do you really think in terms of the contracting piece versus the managing piece on an ongoing basis and where's the i mean 
where do you think the bigger return is or is it equal or how do you think that works? Um, to a certain degree, we, yes, we do have control pretty much on what we are participating. There are certain um, campaigns that are branded and we're participating in them and certain, we, but most of the stuff we do independently. So what we do, how we control the channels and I can definitely relate to what Raul was saying is that you can see return from OTAs much greater um, just because they do certain things better. And, and that's what I meant earlier by saying, I don't think you can switch off certain channels, maybe not always. If Raul's hotels are in a position to do it now, great. Uh, for the UK, it's, it's not yet the position we're in. Um, it's very much about generating revenue. Um, but we do, we do have, I think once we're out of the pandemic, uh, we will go back to a little bit co greater control. But um, because we invested quite heavily in our direct marketing, um, and we do have a quite quite high cost for the marketing, but we actually see a larger proportion right now of direct business uh, than OTS and and any others. So we are kind of seeing the benefits of that. Right. Yeah, that's but true. Whether it is, but the whether it is, I because we are five star luxury hotel, it might be a slightly different story because for a budget sector, there is no chance they will have right now investment to get the same to get to the same volume of business they can see from online travel agencies. They rely about sixty to seven percent is coming from OTS. How much they need to have an investment to re, to see a return? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't doesn't fit everyone. Gotcha. So you brought up a really interesting point. You talked about kind of brand marketing which to me is the one of the most difficult ones, right? Because there's something involved in that, that's something involved in the transaction. Uh, we talk about the number of times, and Maggie, I'm sure you can probably give the most recent statistics, the number of sessions, how many websites do people visit before they book and everything. How do you attribute all that cost? Because every single time they touch us, we're spending an effort marketing, and yet one of the times they touch us, they choose to transact or not. Do we associate everything with that time? How do we? How do you deal with the, the investment in marketing that you just mentioned, Olga? I think I just asked two people that question. So let me say, Maggie, how do we deal with the investment in marketing that Olga just mentioned? That was much better. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. I want to say that, you know, first of all, I'm really glad to hear what uh, uh, Olga and uh, Raul mentioned about you need to actually also think when you actually work with a brand, you cannot just assume that you join all the promotion activities. Because what Raul said is that, okay, if uh, the brand's promotion is going through OTA, then uh, he probably will pass. So I think that is already for me, this is something uh, is very uh, important for all the audience to know. So uh, always evaluate, even if it's brand proposal, I think uh, people need to know. And uh, the second thing uh, about what Scott just mentioned, uh, Google, uh, publish a uh, research which is uh, before COVID, but I think uh, we will see the latest one maybe when we return to normal. But before COVID, uh, Google said that people, on average, it takes people 36 days, goes through 45 touch points to book a room. For us, we think this is ridiculous. But you know, travel is a big decision for many people. If people are going to go to stay at the Olga's Noble Hotel, that's a lifetime event. So I'm not surprised about 36 days and 45 touch points. But then the key question now is, when we calculate uh, the contribution margin by channel, how do you take into consideration that people are jumping from one place to the other, the different touch points? So we talk about we need to have the attribution model. But I think the attribution model, uh, maybe you will be able to keep track of what's going on, how different websites contribute to direct booking. But I think the attribution model may not uh, provide enough information about a contribution made by GDS, uh, OTA, and uh, offline channels. So to answer Scott's question, I think uh, the attribution model is something we need to work on. And when we calculate uh, the profit margin, if we do it by channel, the question is this, how do you recognize all the channel when you consider it takes average people 36 days? 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, I mean, it's amazing. If you think about that, I, that same study, I believe, was the one that said that 80% of our travel initiates on mobile or 85% initiates on mobile, but 80% concludes on desktop. So if you want to track that customer, boy, you've got some pretty sophisticated tracking because you're chasing them from device to device even. <laughs> and everything is happening. I'm sure everyone loves all their information on the internet. So I'm sure you're all signing into everything with your personal data, right, and connecting all that stuff so that we can make nice attribution and we can feel feel good about our marketing. And so, yeah, you're right. It's, I think it's a really, really difficult challenge with all those, with that path and, and all those touch points if we want to be that that sophisticated. So let me back up and be a little bit less sophisticated. Five years ago, anytime you said the word online travel agency, you heard the theme music from Darth Vader coming into Star Wars, like it was the worst thing in the world. It was costing us a tremendous amount of money. But I think that thought is that evol that, that thought is evolving. And Raul, you mentioned it. I'm going to ask you, I ask you to speak about it first. But I think we've at least become sophisticated enough to be able to identify when we're spending 35% margin ourselves to generate business that we're getting from someplace else for 20 and feeling really good about the direct business, but killing the profitability at the same time. So, I mean, Raul, would you say, I mean, even from a big institutional perspective, have, have we become somewhat channel agnostic in that regard? You know, it, you, know you mentioned, you know, driving better on your brand promotion on an OTA than on the brand site itself, which I'm sure there's some brand people right now really <laughs> freaking out when they heard that. But what is that? I mean, how does that cause you to make decisions? It changes things, right? Well, and again, I think that if you if you take a look at all the conversations that we've had for the last five years, you were looking at uh, years when the industry was in its peak, right? You come out post COVID. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, Pre-COVID, um, our portfolio was probably in the 12% range for OTAs. And it was probably in the 20% range for GDS. GDS right now is producing about 6% of our, our revenues. OTA in some hotels is 40%, 50%. So uh, you would have zero or very minimal business transient. You would have zero very minimal um, uh, group business. So a lot of those channels, uh, a lot of those segments would have probably defaulted into property direct or would have defaulted into GDS. When you're looking at the only channel that is producing is the leisure channel, and that channel happens to be the one that you need to drive more revenues in. Um, there, yes, there's a cost calculation about what we want to maximize on, but reality is at some point you need to get to break even. Um, and to give you another kind of interesting tidbits of info, in the US, and I know that again, I am I'm speaking to, to a, a worldwide audience, but um, in the US last week, nationwide occupancy for Saturday was 75%, US. That occupancy was regardless whether it's top 25 markets or not. Top 25 markets on a Tuesday was less than 50%. So right now, Almost 50% of our revenues are coming in on Friday and Saturday, which are heavily leisure and are heavily OTA driven historically. So when we do our calculations, I think it is, um, you know, five years ago, I would have told you I want to minimize certain channels because I am now dealing with how do I maximize the tip of the spear. When you are trying to figure out what this is the only volume you have, then your calculation about cost changes completely because now you need to figure it out, how do I maximize my revenues? Um, and then the other challenge that we're having in the US, believe it or not, that there is the, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, profit per occupied room, that factor is now changing to prof, uh, uh, profit per clean room. And the reason for that is because people are not thinking about the fact that in the US, you have a labor shortage. So sometimes you don't have enough clean rooms in certain uh, dates. And then that also is going to change your calculation as to how do you maximize revenues when you have loss of income because you do not have all rooms available for whatever reason you have. So I think that again, the pre COVID time frame and calculating cost and the calculations we do on the, the corporate side are very different than the current environment. And I think that they are going to also be very different in 2022 and beyond, because we're probably going to get back to a more normalized environment of revenues and, and profitability. 
Scott, may I add something to, to of course, uh, please both do of the statements? So Maggie mentioned that point where the customers are, are jumping from one touch point to another. And I think this is the crucial is like what hotels do when it happens. Okay, how can we, and there is a great opportunity to drive direct business. There are plenty of things hotels can do better. Um, and some properties already increasing the um, seeing the benefits of seeing of that uh, direct uh, business because they invested, they're seeing results now. So there, there is opportunities for hotel to gain more business and to, to secure that customer. Now, what Raul has mentioned, I, I, I really can relate to that. There's a huge shortage right now of staff in the UK as well. And the businesses have to scale down because they are back, because they're not able to deal with the demand. Now, because right now, as we know, there is right now less business coming from the GDS, is, is for me, is what hotels do, have they, um, potentially reduce the expenses on some of the campaigns that would historically go into the GDS, but did they distribute that money into, for example, supporting the in, in-house um, reservation centers or call centers? Because if we see increase of direct business, but are, are we actually looking after that channel? Are we uh, diversifying? Are we quickly reacting to that change of, of channels or not? So that is just something to mention. So, uh, Maggie, I think what that's it saying to us, it, it totally makes sense. Yeah. Absolutely. I think what we're learning from that is you and I need to do some research on whether housekeeping is supposed to be included in the distribution costs or not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's, uh, so let's shift, let's shift a little bit. And, and I think we want to talk a little bit about, uh, about Fabian Bartnick's post, because I think all of us were attracted to a piece of it. And I'm just going to read you a piece of it because I think it's really impactful. And then let's go around and talk about it some more. He said, don't get hung up on profitability percentage. In high demand times, cost of acquisition matters. However, in medium and especially low demand periods, when there's no displacement, the profit generating business should be taken to, to, to drive profit, right? So we should look at dollars, not percentages. The classic argument that we have, the reason that I always fought with the resident manager, you know, and, and uh, you know, let's sell the presidential suite and close the reservation system then if all the percentages matter. Uh, so, um, <laughs> So, where, you know, can we measure it that way? Is that, uh, you know, what what do you guys think? I mean, how do you deal with that? How, how can you, in, in, how can we get sophisticated enough to say we should have no more than a 10% distribution cost on this sold out night, but I'm willing to pay 50% for this Sunday night business and like it and be happy about it. How how can we get there? So Olga, you, you were one of the people that tuned in on this one first. How, how about, I mean, how, how can we get more real? How, how can we talk about making money and not spending percentages? No, I have I have two examples to share. So I always uh, to the new starters in uh, who are joining the company, I always give them an example of uh, do you sell more edamame beans with ninety two percent profit margin or sell wagyu beef at with fifty percent profit margin? Um, it works out you need to sell five hundred times more um, edamame beans to make the same um, to, to make the same amount of money. Um, so I absolutely agree with Fabian. At the end of the day, it doesn't actually matter sometimes what, what occupants you're running or what is ADR. It's actually what you have left. Are you running as busy fools and not making profit? For me, that is more mm. important than what is actually KPIs occasionally. It's good to look at the KPIs, but also depends on, on the business and, and what are their goals. Um, and there was a second example that kind of right now escaped my mind. Um, sorry, a second example came back. Sorry, <laughs> thank you. Um, I was talking to revenue, uh, director of revenue who opened five star hotels recently during the pandemic and they went to quite a drastic measure because they were not getting um, OTS or direct business. They didn't have enough exposure in the market yet um, because they didn't have reviews um, and for a couple of other reasons. So they went to a drastic measure of selling two for the price of one. Was it most profitable decision? Possibly not, but they, 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 they reached the goal they were looking to achieve. And now they opened additional chance where they will get the business. So it's, I agree. So it's not necessarily about a, a percentages, but actually you may have different goals to achieve at different times. Yeah, I, I used to, we have this argument all the time and, and uh, it's really interesting. We just let's go take a look and see how we traditionally price wine. And do we really charge four times, you know, or eight times or 10 times the bottle for a $300 bottle of wine? And, and then how much of it do we actually sell, right? So, uh, you know, where we should be happy with the margin at some point or another with the dollars because we spend the dollars. Um, and, and Raul, how about from an institutional perspective? How, I mean, you know, even when you're talking about sales incentives and some of those things, are, are you able to, are, I mean, how, how does a company or how does a, a hotel or kind of discern between the business I'm willing to pay for because it's incremental and the business that, Boy, I can sell that anyway, and I don't want to pay that much for it. Very good question. I think it's all about opportunity. 
you're trying to maximize revenues and maximizing revenues, you could be maximizing on high demand and maximizing in low demand. So uh, the calculations are very different. I mean, in general, I couldn't tell you that we have an industry or a company wide saying we're not going to pay more than X in a generic sense. I think that when you're looking at a, a leisure destination on a weekend, the calculations could be very different than if you're looking at a select service hotel on a Sunday night. Um, and right now, for example, you know, we talk about the, the, the change of distribution in OTA. The reason why you have a lot more OTA distribution now, it is not because we have strategically selected to say we want more OTA and we'll never be able to get back. It is because you have the absence of other business. And I think in the context of that, you have to take a look at every single uh, day on its own and be able to figure out what is it going to take to maximize the revenue and the profitability for that particular day and that particular hotel. The other thing is that, for example, one of the things that struck me about you know, his comments was that you worry about whether you want incremental profit dollars or incremental profit percentages. That changes the calculation depending on your, um, uh, your investment uh, stack. So if you are a single owner, and you have to pay your mortgage and you have to figure it out how do i make the next payment in this environment you're probably going to be more guided towards i need whole dollars regardless of how much it's going to cost me because i may not be at a break-even point mm. in a high level environment 2019 is a very different uh, calculation but if you are a public company then likely it is that you are going to be more measured on profit margins and the margin percentages and the year-over-year -year changes are going to make a big deal um, on the calculation because that may affect your stock price. So when we take a look at, for example, uh, investments for private companies or um, investments for you know single owner hotels, we also have to keep that in, in consideration regardless of what our philosophy is, because at the end of the day, we have to be an owner advocate and we have to maximize, as I said, the profit of that hotel and the revenues for that hotel based on the owner's needs and requirements at the time of. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that was just a very complex point that got added to the pile. Thank you very much. And so now, Maggie, we need to not only research adding the housekeeping costs, but also the yes. equity structure of the hotel when we <laughs> determine the yes. distribution costs. This is exactly. really turning into a very wide ranging uh, issue. We knew it was big, but we had no idea. Yeah. It was that big. I, we will be busy for the next uh, two, three years, I think. You know, <laughs> you know how academia people act, uh, work. You know, it will take us a long time. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to take us years to prove what you just said. But anyway, okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so let, hey, let's, I want to shift gears a little bit more so it's great sure. we can find it we know where the numbers are that's wonderful we even can understand that there's a slightly different definition for success based on ownership and that makes absolute sense sometimes yeah. that that consideration can even make sense based on the labor market and the cost sometimes you're better off in some situations than others right just based on other things you don't necessarily control so let's say we can find it. it's great we know how to find it we know what we're supposed to get to what parts can you actually manage to make a difference like where can you what levers can you pull and push to, to, to cause something to change? So Meg, let me, let me start with you actually, as you kind of think of that inventory of costs, mm. where's the lowest hanging fruit possibly? Well, I want to say that this is going to, we come back to this idea, you know, we use so many different kinds of technology. So, you know, Raul uh, reminded us about uh, how do you track? Right, you want to track the transaction between different uh, system, and then of course we have revenue management, uh, sales management, uh, and uh, different software. Okay, and what I want to say is this: I don't see the possibility for us to be able to just say that okay, then we don't do it. And Olga just tell us that like, how much effort you know, independent hotel, or you know, you run the different sales marketing activities, so you don't get lucky. You work hard to get the customer into your hotel. And I just don't see the opportunity to go down, you know? I just hope what we will be able to do is if we are able to do many successful marketing campaigns, like what the old guy is talking about, then our demand will be strong. When our demand is strong, then we will be confident to increase the room rate. 
Okay, that's how I see it. I don't see many opportunities to reduce the cost, but I hope we will be able to build up enough demand for our products, then we feel comfortable to increase the room rate. That's how I see it. Mm-hmm. And let me, Olga, let me ask you the same question. How do you feel? Do you think it's, it's, I mean, is the bigger opportunity in driving the demand and raising the price is the bigger opportunity in becoming more efficient and really understanding the costs? Where, where does the opportunity lie? Most probably. I wouldn't, I wouldn't reduce the cost. Um, I think it's about where do you direct the cost? Okay. So mm. where, where are you lot more likely to get right now the business and focus that attention there and maybe invest a little bit more into that channel once and then about you know in a couple of months time something else will be will be like okay well we have another opportunity that just maximize from that something that i'm seeing actually a lot in the uk market because of probably pent up demand the customers actually not that much worried about the cost or, or the price as such they're looking for value for money and that is right now much that's where I'm seeing opportunities right now. The, the, mm. the, the price itself, yes, there is you know reason, reasonable levels and you need to find your sweet pot, uh, spot where you're selling a, a good volume. Um, again, in context of the market conditions and similar hotels, but the, that value for money proposition, I think for customers is, is more interested right now in that rather than what it's actually cost them. So to help us a little bit more what that means in a, in a, in a, in a really more direct practical sense. Is that, I mean, is it is it the price point or is that, more packaging and value adding and how does what form does that take when you think about it yeah so for me it's a packaging and a value added um and that's where i'm seeing it's it's also about the creating unique experiences um so you need to constantly bring bring something right now we are very much focused on domestic market right so we don't have an international travel it's how do you continuously excite the customers you know you want to bring some unique experience it, um, kind of one after another, just to keep that, you know, traffic in, coming in. Um, and yes, packages and value added, that's for me the biggest one, the drivers. And it's not really, I don't think revenue management is about just the bedrooms. I see it as a holistic approach, overall experience and total revenue management. That's why I talk about, okay, what can we do in F and B um, in, if you have a thesis or something else. So it's, it's a, it's a bigger picture. It's a holistic approach. Yeah, I mean, I think that one of the things that we're seeing a little bit also, and, and I'm, I'm interested to hear all of your thoughts, um, we're seeing a little bit of a shift in consumer demand away from the point of sale, a little bit more towards thinking about travel. So as soon as you start to package, uh, you start to put together a product that's more of an experience, as you mentioned, it gives you a better opportunity to market it as well. You can get out of that fighting for London hotels at $17 a click or whatever you're paying for currently. And you can get into getting in front of people, even using social media, potentially organically and free. But effectively, you have to sort of change your mindset to start selling that customer's future memory, not the bed and the toilet that they're going to utilize when they're gaining the memory, right? If we get into the commodity business, uh, we're, we're, we're kind of toast, right? Um, and I think the other thing that you mentioned about investment in marketing, we shouldn't neglect the investment that the online travel agencies have made in building that loyalty within the leisure segment, and it's paying off for them too, right? They, anyone, These companies are publicly traded companies. If anyone's curious how much they spend on marketing, you should go check. Uh, but it's a much larger percentage than the average hotel, and therefore they're getting a return on uh, they're getting a return on that investment as well, for sure. Uh, how about you, Raul? Where where do you see the low hanging fruit? I mean, do you, do you you mentioned it's really kind of one at a time, but if you had to take a look at it institutionally, where where does it seem like it pops up the most when you when you look at it across a portfolio? Very good. I think that it um, you can control everything. I think you can have the ability to influence everything. And I will give you an example. You can control your cost through either strategic intention or the absence of. I'll give you an example. If you have and you say, I am going to take and spend $20,000 on SEO, you are going to have more distribution online. If you're going to take uh, and spend $2,000 on Expedia Travel Ads, you will generate more revenues into that channel. Or if you simply say, I am going to stop putting money into those channels, then you're going to, again, change the perception or change the, 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 the number of reservations you have through that channel just because you have a, you remove something out of it. We all know that the, the most effective channel is direct. So if we were to take those things, and I'm not saying I'm suggesting one other, I'm saying give you an example. 
that if I take those funds and I take that and uh, and basically hire a um, another sales manager that focuses on smart, focuses on corporate, focuses on group, you will have more direct distribution. So. What we are thinking about here is not uh, that I am going to shut down one channel to another, is that you're going to intentionally focus on one versus another, which is what I believe you can do in cold channel displacement. So if I intentionally book more ahead of time through the direct channels, whether that would be group, business transient where there is, um, or any other channel other than OTAs, then I am in fact, again, changing my cost structure. So I think, again, as I said, you can have it through, as I said, a um, as an intentional strategy or, again, as ignoring one channel. And simply it is, well, that is what we are trying to do. We're simply saying right now the channel that is producing, it is, again, direct channels, uh, property. We've had a lot of, for example, in the U.S. National Guards or nurses and things like that because of COVID. We're going to go after that channel. We are seeing now some green shoots coming in on the business transient side as the states start to remove restrictions. And then that is the next focus channel that we are going to go after because we traditionally have been a very strong midweek corporate and group organization. And we are going to get back to those levels. Until then, again, we are going to do whatever we need to do to make sure that we maximize our revenues in the current environment. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, I actually was going to, It's you made me think of something when I saw something that ran across the screen at the bottom. And I'm kind of, I would like to get everyone's on thoughts on this. And that is the whole, um, once you once you got it, you can't get it out. You know, once you've got 50% OTA, you can't get it out. And I actually am not a big believer in that. I actually believe that the branded channel, the direct channel, if you're managing it well, they'll pay you more. You're competing in a brand agnostic channel otherwise. So if you can create enough of your own demand that you can raise your prices, effectively you're going to pull, you're going to switch shift your mix because you're going to be more attractive to that direct customer than you are to the totally brand agnostic one. So effectively you're pricing yourself out of some of that OTA business and you're shifting your mix by yourself. But it comes from creating displacement, quite frankly, because the word we haven't said yet, but we're dancing around is perishability. And we don't really, you know, it's like we 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 have to take that piece into consideration all the time. And I don't think that in, with the exception of potentially when a different metric matters like a publicly traded environment, I don't think any of us really have the luxury unless we own the hotel to decide to make less profit. I mean, it's not really kind of like not what we're supposed to do. That's not why not why they pay us. So um, let's, let's, we've got a few minutes left. I wanna shift into something ever so slightly differently. Let's now talk about the people that have to do this. So uh, Diego, uh, one of the, um, People that puts this all together. He's actually one of the um, uh, one of the people that was responsible for the revenue dictionary. Uh, he's uh, the chief revenue officer of Palladium Hotels. Many of you know them. But one his post for uh, in the uh, panel started out was we had a great line in it. Could we start talking about becoming a profit manager instead of a revenue manager? So I'm wondering, Olga, go ahead. Let me start with you and tell me what you think. But I'm asking you specifically: Do you think it's the same person, or do you think it's somebody else? Is it do we? Do we have the right people in the chair right now to be able to make that shift? Yeah, I think so. Um, I would like to think so. For, for me, that was a key phrase when I, when I read it. I was like, yes, that's actually, that, that's, a, that's a key here. Um, yeah. I think we, many revenue managers moved from um, being revenue managers to uh, profit management already some time ago. Every single decision we make has a, has an impact on the bottom line. and. Um, Plenty of examples we had, you know, hotels had to make decisions. Are they going to continue being open during the, the second lockdown or do they close? Um, and many revenue managers did support GMs with making that decision. Equally, in April, we could open for five weeks earlier, operating um, F&B outlets outside uh, in the terraces. And many hotels, again, looked at what is a break-even point, um, you know, to build the terraces, to find employees, um, and some did a really good job um, on, on finding that, that uh, break-even point and some probably didn't make actually uh, revenue uh, or didn't cover their costs. So, um, yeah, I think revenue managers already a long time ago moved into this a little bit more on profit management and, and occasionally asset management and God knows what we ask, uh, what else we ask to do. Um, at least able to support um, GMs and sales and marketing and working together alongside other departments 
you know, it's, it's sometimes as a simple example, working out what is the cost, what, how much you're making from, from breakfast um, sold. Um, is it worth doing certain activities or actually it's, it's not the wisest decision? So, yeah, I, th I think we already, we have the right people and we it's been a long way towards the, the point where we're actually supporting with other functionalities rather than just revenue management. Cool. Uh, and Ronald, let me kind of follow up with you. You mentioned group. Um, and so group is a really weird one, right? Because we think of group as being direct. Oh, it's wonderful business. Uh, I recently did something for a mutual friend of ours, as a matter of fact, with, with a very large portfolio. And the, the effectively, if you created a margin with group or you created a commission based on the specifically the direct sales uh, costs associated with the group sales department, they ranged from single digits to 45% of revenue. So it was like this incredible breadth of, and, and I said, well, what about this hotel? Well, that person also does these other functions that are not revenue producing. I'm like, oh, great. Now we're in the, the P&L with all the expenses around it. But how, how does that come into play when you really start to get outside the box? Is it a new person that's able to do that? Or do you think it's if we have it in place? Um, you know, great question. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the, the specific asset and the complexity of that asset. Um, if you have a hotel that has, you have 30,000 square feet of meeting space, you have to have group. Uh, there's also a factor of incidental spend. Uh, you know, a business transient guest probably is less likely to spend as much money as a group guest would because they would have breakfast, lunch, coffee breaks, and dinner. So you look at it again as um, you know, holistic approach to say, I can find sell this group and get incremental revenues as part of that process, which I would not get otherwise with any other type of business. Um, I, you know, the, the other interesting thing about it is that the industry is kind of a, uh, there's a bifurcation of what, what people think about how revenue management is going to be in the future. You either will be a generalist, which means that you would be all things consider revenue, which is what people said, total revenue management. If you really think about it, the vast majority of the times, uh, specialization has become the norm. Meaning, you have had either a specialist that is in a full service, big box, thousand room hotel, or you have a cluster director revenue that has 10, 12, 15 select service hotels. And if you have a cluster environment, it's very difficult to get to this granular level. And I think that that's one of the reasons why in a big hotel, yes, you can have that director revenue be responsible in charge and uh, uh, deal with all these uh, factors. In a cluster environment, you probably are heavily more relying on technology to help you maximize those channels. Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about it, there's been an evolution that started out with you were the revenue manager. You're probably the only person in the hotel with a laptop. So now there's some prices to maintain. So now you're responsible for distribution and digital marketing as well. 20 years later, now it's 50% of the job, right? And I think that in many cases, furloughs, have pointed that out to companies that as they rebuild their organizations, they're rebuilding them with specialists and not with those, not with those internally kind of built by, I don't know, just accumulation of stuff, kind of large positions. I think you make a, a really awesome point. So Maggie, let me give you the last word because Enzo's over there. He's got this gong thing that he rings if you run too long. Um, but uh, so let me ask you, you and I are in the business of, of helping people for the future. Do you think this makes us a sexier job as we go forward or do you think this makes it more difficult? Well, I think, you know, a more dialogue like what we have today will really close the gap between the academia and the industry. I think Scott and I, we really work close with the industry practitioners. And, uh, you know, this is what we want. We want to work with practitioners to build a future together. And that's how I see it. Cool. All right. That seems like the perfect final word for me, Enzo. Cool, guys. That's great as usual. Always great conversation, great topics, and especially, guys, you did a great job. So I think that the audience still get there, you know, commenting, and uh, and they really were strongly engaged with this panel. So the topics, you know, it's, it's very hot. But now, how do you handle all those stuff, guys, without technology? So right now, what we're doing, we are starting a, um, three presentations from three different vendors, um, the first one will be, let me correct you if I'm wrong. I think the first one is going to be with Union Analytics. Then we have our ideas, revenue solution, and then info. And then we close after those three presentations with a masterclass with Fornova. 
But with, before we start those pitches, guys, uh, quickly, I just want to remind you that in combination, in a, in a combination with this live series, we also release a huge, I think it's the largest dictionary on revenue management and hospitality. I just want to make sure, guys, you know that and, and you find out more by downloading for free this ebook. Let me share the video one second and I come back in a bit. Mm -hmm.